I, I want to start off um, going back to actually a, a point which was raised in the very first talk by Steve, um, this old philosophical problem um, that relativity cannot explain some basic features of the world. In particular, we know it cannot explain consciousness, and I know consciousness is sometimes regarded as outside physics, but personally I feel it's, it really is going to have to play a, a crucial role. We know the experience of time is one in which our consciousness is rather like a bead walking up the world line of our brain. Um, and we know that can't be explained by relativity theory. Uh, if you're the sort of person who wants to believe that you're free will and that you can sometimes make a decision as to whether you're going to go to this talk or go to the beach, you have this intuitive concept that you've got these different world lines and you have to decide between them. And then if you've got the idea, well, there are other people in the world as well as myself, they've got their consciousnesses, and in some sense I want to have some way of correlating your consciousness when that goes past, uh, when we meet, stay in the street, how do I correlate your bead and my bead? Bernard, perhaps you could point to the screen we can see. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, these questions, of course, are completely meaningless within a, a normal block universe description. Um, and also, of course, it relates to quantum theory, because for those people who think that consciousness is something to do with the collapse of the wave function, um, which of course isn't all physicists, these problems are related, because again, you think, before I make my quantum observation, I've got various possible outcomes, and then somehow when I do my observation, that's selecting one of these observations. And of course, again, you've got this idea that the future is somehow open, but the past is, is fixed. So the question is, how do you resolve that problem? Well, one possibility, which some people have suggested, is that maybe you need some extra dimension, which um, on top of the, the four dimensions, in which you describe that process. And so, for example, you imagine these are different uh, space-time, four-dimensional space-times. Here you've got your different options. When you make your decision or your quantum observation, you, you force the, your world line into one particular state and then uh, you're in your second four-dimensional slice, then you make another observation or decision, and then you have your third stage. So the idea is that as you go in this extra dimension, you're actually uh, making the future become um, actuated. And so you can think of it as in terms of this sort of five-dimensional diagram, in which you're sort of walking up this mountain where you've got an indeterminate future and a fixed past. So that's just one way of describing it, and and various people have done this. Um, or rather, the person I know best who's done this is probably Henry Stapp, and he has a view of quantum collapse which is rather like this, um, except that uh, he uses a Tomonaga Swinger formalism in which you basically push forward your space surface in different ways independently in different places. And that's also related to a, a deep problem of uh, the many fingers of time, um, and as uh, uh, Julian Barber and Brendan Foster have talked about some papers. That's very important because there is a, a very deep way in which the Einstein-Hilbert action comes out uniquely if you want to describe how you can push forward the many fingers of time uh, consistently. Now, why is that relevant at the moment? Because, of course, the question is, um, there are now, of course, lots of extra dimensions in physics. And can some of those extra dimensions play that role? Well, if you look at brain cosmology, um, a picture, the standard picture of brain cosmology is that our world is a brain, four-dimensional brain, moving through a five-dimension, fifth dimension of a static bulk. Mm -hmm. And that bulk is described by a five-dimensional Schwarzschild anti-decitter solution. And here is your metric. Um, and the fifth, the fifth coordinate is, is the R1, and that's the, rather like a short chart black hole, you see, but the, the fifth dimension is the radial coordinate of the black hole. It's not the normal black hole of the brain. And the cosmic, the position of the brain corresponds actually to the cosmic scale factor. So the value of R, the fifth dimension, is the cosmic scale factor. So what happens in this pretty standard way of picturing the brain, cosmic brain solution, the brain is simply moving through the fifth dimension. And uh, K here is the curvature, the normal curvature index. M is the mass of the black hole. 
And if you plot the mass equal to zero, it basically just gives you the Randall Sundgren type one frame. And L is associated with the, the cosmological constant. And so in some sense, therefore, it seems to me that that naturally fulfills the role of this extra dimension we wanted to try and have to describe the collapse of the quantum wave function. Now, that's fairly standard. I think what maybe isn't appreciated is that if you look at this, this solution, um, if you go back and you put uh, k equal to 1, it really does just look like a, a five-dimensional black hole solution. It's got an event horizon at a particular value of the, uh, the fifth dimension, which, remember, corresponds to a particular value of the cosmic uh, scale factor. And so the question arises, if you have these, a solution like this, what does it correspond to when the, the, the cosmic scale factor goes through that black hole event, that five-dimensional black hole event horizon? Um, you know, we've heard about from the Spona, for example, pictures where you say that the, the, the collapse of a black hole generates a universe. It's not quite the same because this is a, a five-dimensional black hole which is generating the universe. Um, now, the idea is that in some sense, from the outside point of view, you know that if you're looking at a black hole, when something falls into the black hole, in some sense it freezes at the horizon. So in some sense, the, the, you lose a dimension of time and you lose a dimension of space. And the idea is that that's, uh, analogously is what happening, is happening in this five-dimensional case. When you, what happens when you are <coughs> values of the fifth dimension less than this event horizon, then in some sense, the time and the space coordinate are, inter are interchanged. Um, this seems to have some uh, interesting link with the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, that was studied by some Japanese, uh, well, 2001. Um, if you make the tron interchange the T and R, it turns out that you, you can extend the ADS CFT correspondence uh, from the original setting where it was just anti the sitter to the black hole situation as well. So there seems to be something quite interesting there. One of the questions is though, this is a cosmological solution, can you have an analogous situation locally where um, five-dimensional collapse is producing some form of four-dimensional matter? Um, now, the relationship, of course, between ADS and CFT is interesting because in some sense, it shows that there is a link. In some sense, pure curvature it can generate matter. I mean, the matter is, is the conformal field for, and the ADS is the, is the curvature. Um, and, and so there have been particular applications of this idea. For example, some work by Maidu and Artic and various other people show that you can actually have in Kaluza Klein um, six-dimensional black hole solutions in which you have to have the einstein uh, gauss bonnet um, action. Is that the, how much time do I have at that point? Uh, uh, zero. <laughs> and so then the idea is that you get the, uh, this is an example where the six-dimensional black hole is naturally uh, collapsing to make matter, and you can have it from um, the Vigia solution. Let me just say, the crucial thing here is the approach to embedding. Now, relativists are interested in the question of whether um, you can embed represent solutions of relativity as embedding in higher dimensional spaces, and people have studied that. But there are really two approaches. There's the induced matter approach, where you're saying that uh, space is, matter is just associated with a four-dimensional space-like surface, and in some sense the matter comes out of the higher dimensional vacuum solution. And then there's a the more conventional membrane approach, which people like, you know, the randall sundgren approach. Um, but there is, uh, it seems, a subtle relationship between those two approaches, which I can't go into. They are, in some sense, equivalent. And so one of the, the hopes is that you can somehow use the embedding space of relativity and identify it with the higher dimensions required in M theory. So let me just end at that point. The conclusion is that there is higher dimensions and black holes and embedding may, in some sense, imply a link between the flow of time, quantum collapse, many worlds, and the origin of the universe. Thank you.